The flag you see on the opening slide is one of over 1,300 objects in the Korea collection at the Royal Ontario Museum. Do you like it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's just a flag, but there's something wonderful and magical about this flag. And I'll tell you what's so special about this at the end of my talk, so stay tuned. <laughs> Our story today begins in the early 20th century, the period also called the Age of Imperialism. This was the time when a handful of Western powers colonized most <laughs> parts of the world. Among all non-Western powers, Japan became the first to successfully modernize following the Western model in a series of reforms called Meiji um, Restoration during the time of Emperor Meiji. So here you see on the slide the leaders of Meiji Japan. Look at their uh, outfit. These leaders sought to completely transform Japan into a Western nation by taking radical measures, changing everything from government to food, costume, everything. As you see in this painting of Meiji Emperor and court ladies in Western style outfit. Many leading intellectuals in Japan at the time, such as Fukuzawa Yukichi, so he was a former samurai, that's him later on. Uh, many leading intellectuals in Japan believed that Japan needed to say goodbye to all the bad friends in Asia and should join the West. And this is not my quote. Uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi, in fact, called bad friends of Asia and become a Western power, even become England of Asia. But how? They believed to be like the British Empire, Japan had to colonize. So they started with colonization of islands nearby, such as the Ryukyu Islands. They moved on to colonize Taiwan after winning the first Sino-Japanese War. Japan regarded the natives of Taiwan as savages to be civilized. And they started massive sugar plantation business, as you see on the slide right there. After Taiwan, Japan turned its eyes towards Korea. Why Korea? It was close by, rich in resources. It was also a gateway to China. At the time, Korea was ruled by the Joseon Dynasty. Look at the dates, from 1392 to 1897. This is the longest dynasty in world history, 505 years uh, long. By the time of King Gojong, whose portrait you see right there, Joseon was already 500 years old. And as you know, anything that old could have a lot of issues, no matter how glorious it had been in the past. In the late 19th century, Joseon was dealing with a lot of internal and external issues. As Joseon was weakening, neighboring countries like Russia and Japan competed to extend their control over Korea. <clears throat> and as Japan became aggressive, Queen Min, wife of uh, King Gojong, approached Russia to counterbalance Japan. The Japanese minister to Korea at the time, Miura Goro, did not like this. So he planned and carried out the assassination of Queen in 1895. A group of Japanese assassins enter, assassins enter the palace at night, slay the queen along with about 40 eunuchs and maids, put gasoline on the queen's body, and burnt it. On the bottom slide, you see the state funeral of the queen. In desperation, King Gozong declared the founding of the Korean Empire. But Japan forced him to, at gunpoint uh, to sign the Protectorate Treaty in 1905, which you see right there. But Gozong tried to seek help from countries like the USA. So when American First Lady Alice Roosevelt visited Korea in 1905, Emperor Gozong gave her a personal letter to uh, deliver to President Roosevelt who showed no interest in helping Korea out. Two years after that, um, there was the World Peace Conference in The Hague. Once again, Emperor Gojong dispatched three Korean representatives to report and denounce the acts of aggression 
by Japan. Japan did not like this, and by the way, these representatives were barred from entering the conference uh, because Japan didn't want them to attend the meeting. So after this incident, Japan forced the abdication of Emperor Hozong and replaced him uh, with his second son, Emperor Sunjong, and coerced him to uh, sign a new convention that would give away actual political power to Japan. Japan forced the Korean army to disband and took away Korea's nominal sovereignty and turned it into a colony on August 29th. 1910. So notice the Japanese flags in front of the royal palace. How did the world respond? Do you think the world cared? Five days before August, 19, uh, August 29, 1910, there was a New York Times article that says Korea as a nation to end this week. Its emperor agrees to, uh, to a convention giving absolute control to Japan. No disturbance expected. And people have no idea that this is going to happen. How about in Canada? There was an article on the Globe before it became Globe and Mail, dated uh, August 26, 1910. It is titled, Britain has no objection, which meant Canada also had no objection. <coughs> Two days after uh, Korea lost its sovereignty to Japan, in fact, this article was written on August 30th, okay, so the day after the event happened, there was a Globe article on the issue. Really short. Two sentences. The deposed emperor of Korea has conferred decorations upon Lieutenant General Japan's resident general of Korea and other Japanese notables. The capital is quiet. This was on page five. I'll show you the larger page. So where is this article found? Right next to the soap, right? <laughs> That's what it is, just two sentences long. So why didn't the world care? It was because years prior to 1910, Japan had been negotiating with Western powers to gain their support for its planned colonization of Korea. So we look at this Christmas article or the, the, well, from 1905, 1909, uh, the Christmas day. This is an interview with the former foreign minister of Japan, Hayashi. Mm -hmm. And Hayashi is telling Canada that Japan is simply following America's footsteps in colonizing Hawaii. Okay. So Japan wishes to annex Korea just as the U.S. annexed Hawaii and turned it into its 50th state. Colonizing Hawaii versus colonizing Korea. So what made Japan's colonization of Korea different from other examples of coloniz uh, colonization such as colonization of Hawaii. I don't have time for discussion, so. So have a look at the map. Japan's colonization of Korea was a very unique case in world history. Typically, colonization was explained as a process of civilized empires civilizing the uncivilized people elsewhere, often far, far away and they called them savages. But Korea was not a faraway savage land. It was Japan's closest neighbor with a highly sophisticated culture and over 4,000 years of recorded history. To complicate the issue, Japan saw Korea as a culture to learn from until 200 years prior. There was a long history of cultural exchanges. So imagine like Germany trying to colonize France. What would that look like? Therefore, in order to subjugate Korea, it became really important for Japan to rewrite, reinvent Korean history, even obliterate Korean history. 
Japan tried to identify historical and cultural reasons for the backwardness of Korean people. And to justify the conquering of Korea, Japan had to create a lot of myth. For instance, that Korea in the ancient past belonged to Japan. Occupation of Korea, therefore, is historically justified. Japan also preached the, the innate superiority of the Japanese race using scientific racism, um, the method used by other imperialist powers at the time, to show that the skulls of Koreans prove their inferiority. <laughs> Japan's propaganda worked, and Canadians working closely with the Japanese administration came to believe that Japan's colonization of Korea was justified. <clears throat> For instance, in this uh, Globe article from September 25, 1912, Bishop Hamilton of the Canadian Anglican Diocese of Japan, so he works in Japan, writes that Japan had assumed the white man's burden in Korea that Japan joined the ranks of Western powers to civilize the rest of the world, following the lead of the British and the Americans, carrying the rest of the world to, towards civilization on the mountaintop. From August 1910 to August 1945, for 35 years, Japan occupied Korea and imposed a harsh colonial rule. So this was the first Governor General, Terauchi Masataki, and that's the Governor General's building on the bottom. Japan was a latecomer to the business of imperialism and had the advantage of learning from Western powers, creating uniquely effective colonial strategies. Colonization of Korea also happened really quickly. To start, they banned the right to assembly, banned Korean language newspapers. Japanese officials and school teachers in Korea all wore uniform and swords. Right? With that court procedure, the armed police could arrest and prosecute people. They indeed arrested a large number of nationalists. Economically, Japan transformed Korea into a supplier of food and resources took away 40% of all farmland in Korea and sold these lands to Japanese development companies at really cheap prices. Japan also focused on building uh, infrastructure such as railways, ports, roads, communications for easy extraction of resources. So look at all the rice, bags of rice ready to be shipped to Japan. Landless farmers left Korea to find work. Many educated people went to the West and tried to gain foreign support to obtain independence. Many also went to China, especially Manchuria, because there they could have a little more freedom to organize political and military assemblies to fight Japan. My great-grandfather became a landless farmer. He had to take his family to Manchuria. My grandfather was born in Manchuria. Japan relied on force to ruthlessly subjugate any Korean resistance in total disregard for Korean traditions and interests. While all that was happening, there were Canadians living and working in Korea. The first Canadian missionary to step on Korean soil was James Gale graduate of the University of Toronto, arrived in Korea in 1888. It is said Gale had the best knowledge of the Korean language. He was a linguist. He did more than just preach the gospel and made great contribution in Korean language education. He's the author of the very first Korean English dictionary published in 1911. He collaborated Korean linguists. Gale praised the Korean script, Hangul, as a matter of pride for the entire world. He translated Korean literature 
folk tales, 17th century novel, The Cloud Dream of the Nine, into English. Because he said the world should thank the Koreans for their literature. Like Gail, many missionaries um, had very close connection with Korean language education, offering Korean language classes at church. When Japan was banning Korean language in the regular schools that they were offering. So different from what the church was doing in Canada with all the residential schools. <clears throat> Salvation Army missionary Gerald Bonwick, um, he was involved in a publication ministry. So they published a lot of stuff in Korean, such as the Salvation Army newspaper, but also with children's uh, books. Not just with Christian content, but general knowledge, you know, history, world literature, and so on and so on. Elda Struthers was a United, uh, United Church uh, minister from Hamilton. Um, she went to Korea. There were many women missionaries, too. She donated her photo diary, which you see. That's uh, part of our collection. The photos show her early years in Korea. So one of the first things that she did when she arrived in Korea was to learn Korean. That's her Korean language teacher. So once she learned Korean, she taught at the girls' school. And that's the school that where, where she taught at. There are also many medical missionaries, Canadian medical missionaries uh, in Korea. The Severus Hospital in Seoul, which was the largest Western-style hospital in the country, at the time, was headed by the Canadian doctor, Dr. Oliver Avison. He was the head director of the hospital. Dr. Avison uh, left his job as a professor at the University of Toronto and devoted 43 years of his life laying the foundation of modern medical research and care in Korea. Many Canadian doctors and administrators joined the hospital because, you know, the leading director was Canadian after all. Um, the hospital also uh, opened a medical school and they taught courses in Korean, not in Japanese or English, working closely with Koreans, supporting them. Then in January 1918, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson delivered his famous 14-point speech before the U.S. Congress, supposedly laying out a new, a new direction for the U.S. and the world, program for the peace of the world. Among the 14 points, point number five became really important. And this is what he said. A free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims, based upon a strict observation of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. Korean nationalists all over the world saw this as an opportunity. Maybe this time the U.S. will help us. The U.S. will support Korea's self-determination after nine years of Japan, uh, Japanese rule. So they sent their representatives to Paris Peace Conference. Again, these representatives could not get permission to attend a conference. Why? Because all representatives had to represent a government. They didn't have a government to represent. But of course, they're not going to just come home, so they made pamphlets in French because it was in Paris. They met with journalists who came to report the event, and that's a picture that they took with the journalist. The day after the conference ended, there was sad news. Emperor Gojong died. The globe feature is death, one sentence or two. 